The Calgary Flames and Montreal Canadiens made a big blockbuster trade today. The first one of the trade season, Tyler Toffoli is going to Calgary and Montreal is getting a first round pick top 10 protected as well as a prospect in Emil Heineman. They're getting NHL journeyman and nah, Tyler Pitlick and a fourth round pick. We're going to break down what these picks mean to both teams right now. Calgary, Montreal fans, fans who are fans of the NHL trade deadline, lock and load yourself in because Coach Ryan D is going to walk you through the business of hockey. That is what we do on this channel. We break down games, talk about general manager positions, coach positions, and give you a little bit of an insight as to what is going on in the brains of hockey minds, both statistically and critically. So starting with the Calgary Flames, what are they getting first? Well, Daryl Sutter is getting a player that he's familiar with back in Tyler Toffoli over to Calgary, and they are getting a top six player. They're getting a top six player that's going to slot in on their second line between Backland and Coleman over there on the left. And this gives Calgary a pretty potent top nine. So when you take a look at their first line, which is fantastic, Goudreau, Kachuk, and Lindholm, and then you take a look at the third line centered by Sean Monaghan, that has Andrew Mangiapane on the right and Dylan Dubé on the left. This second line falls in really nicely and Calgary has a very dangerous top nine in the Pacific Division. Calgary thinks they're all in right now towards the Stanley Cup and I don't blame them. So this is a really good addition for Calgary. Yes, their pick could end up being something of a decent player, but at the end of the day, they're getting Tyler Toffoli back on a $4.25 million contract with term, meaning they get 200 regular season games barring injury from Tyler Toffoli in this deal and the playoff run. So that's a big deal. Now, is Cal does this make Calgary a top team like Colorado or Vegas? No, it does not. But Calgary had a chance to win the Stanley Cup before they made this move. This only improves their chance to win the Stanley Cup. They are not an odds on favorite, but when you get into the playoffs, especially with Daryl Sutter coach teams and the fact that he's got Stanley Cup pedigree, this only helps their case for their march. And he's going to be there for the next three playoff runs. I do predict that the Calgary Flames will end up making the playoffs at least two out of the next three years, guaranteeing one this year. I think it's easy going to go three for three, but you never know what's going to happen. Look at the Jets this year. Totally fell off. So Calgary, good luck in the playoffs. This is a good pick. Way to get the business in early and set the market. Montreal, first off, let's start with the unsexy pieces of this deal, and that's Tyler Pitlick. Tyler Pitlick's an NHL journeyman that was drafted by Edmonton, was meh, went to Dallas, was meh, signed with Philadelphia, meh, went to Arizona, meh. I mean, you're cut from Arizona. How bad are you? God, playing 4,500 fans, much terrible organization. And then you move over to the Calgary Flames. You play 25 games, you get two points, and you get shipped out. Montreal, you're just getting a guy that can play. That's all it is. That's all you want. Montreal is in the race for the lottery right now. Totally fine pick to add in. I'm sure Calgary said, please just take this guy. Like, I doubt it was asked for. The fourth round pick. When we take a look at fourth round picks in this, NHL picks are interesting. And I'm going to throw up a quick graph here that shows, and I'll send the link down below as to where I got this, but it's a reasonable graph that breaks down how NHL teams do by draft. You have to play more than 100 games to count as a hit in this one. Everybody has their own criteria. I'm just going to go ahead and use this one. We could do our own math, but what's the point? And it really goes ahead and shows that you got a 22% chance for someone to play 100 or more games in the fourth round. That's not bad. I mean, it's a dart throw. It's really interesting, though, when you take a look at an NHL draft, the first round picks are gold. Top five picks are money in the bank. They have almost a 0% bust rate. And yes, I know, Nail Yakupov, Michael Dell call, but literally it busts so rarely that statistically speaking, you could round up to 100% and be safe making that call. So top five picks are money in the bank. First round picks are massive. Second round picks fall off a cliff, absolute cliff, second round to first round. It's not even close, but they're slightly better than every other round. Every other round after that is similar. So the NHL could go the path of the NBA and only draft the first two rounds and likely everything would be fine. But the NHL also does like a sorting order of operations. So ensuring teams get a chance to make a pick is important because when you look at a team like Tampa Bay, who ends up nailing a lot of picks between rounds two and round seven, dropping off round three to round seven just doesn't give everybody the same chance. Plus, there's money signing where you're going to go, letting players just pick their team at that point. A little bit chaotic. So I understand why they go to seven rounds, but you theoretically could throw out rounds three to seven and just sign free agents. It works well too. So the fourth round pick has a very low probability to hit, but in this particular situation for the Montreal Canadiens, why wouldn't you want the dart throw? 
add a little bit of a sweetener on top, right? And then finally, we take a look at the 20-year-old from Sweden, Emil Heinemann, who is playing in the Swedish Men's Hockey League right now. Look, the guy is worth 0.25 to 0.4 points per game right now in Finland. It's always skewed when you're playing over there in Finland. Finland? It's all the same, right? No, it isn't. Totally different countries, coach. Sweden Sweden, their neighbor. When he's playing over there in Sweden, it doesn't matter where you're playing in Europe. It's all big rink hockey. So points are harder to come by because it's a lot of contain. It's lower scoring games, bigger rink, harder to score. In my opinion, that's a video for another day. If you want that video, though, leave a comment down below. And if I get enough comments saying, hey, explain the difference between big rink and small rink, go try and D will go ahead and do that. And while you're there, leave a comment in this video and smash a like for me. That's the best way to share these videos. Subscribing is awesome, but go ahead. Don't forget to click that like button. It really does help a small channel like me to spread this to more people. So Emil Heinemann for Montreal Canadian fans, he's got a good chance to be a top nine player for the Habs, I believe. I mean, I know we just said 34% of the second round end up doing it, but I think he's going to be in that 34%. He's a nice player. He's got a chance to be top nine. Worst case scenario, you got a, you got a player in the AHL. He's only 20 and second round picks, in my opinion, have till they're up to 25th birthday in order to make the NHL. So they have a seven year window before they need to become a regular NHL contributor before the NHL bypass them and said, nah, you're not worth it anymore. But up to 25, the NHL will take a long extended look, whether it's with this current team or another current team at second round picks. They don't just throw them in the trash. So he's going to have a few years to develop in the AHL. He's going to have to come over here and play in the AHL likely before he cracks Montreal, but he's got a chance to be a top nine. Finally, the first round pick, it's top 10 protected. That means if somehow Calgary ends up falling off a cliff, they don't make the playoffs, and this ends up being a top 10 pick because they're in the lottery, Calgary can choose to keep it, defer that pick to 2023 for Montreal, but that's likely to not happen. It's like 99%. They're going to make the playoffs. And they could make a reasonably deep run in the playoffs. Second round, third round is not out of the question for Calgary. So this pick could end up falling anywhere between pick 16 and 25, most likely. More likely in the 20s than in the teens, to be honest, Habs fans. But it could be as low as pick 32. Calgary could win the Stanley Cup, and that's not out of the realm of possibilities. I do not say that facetiously at all. So pick 16 to 32 is the range. Likely the range is going to be 16 to 25. Guessing even better, probably 20 to 25. That's that's my educated guess. So what is that worth? Well, first off, you got to look at what they're giving up. Tyler Tavoli is 200 games left on his contract, 200 games of proven NHL contribution plus playoffs. Well, we go ahead and we pick up this chart here and what we can see is, and I'll leave the, the link to this statistical model down below if you want to check it out after the video. Stay with us. I'm just going to summarize it for you anyway. But what this tells us is how many games we can expect each pick to play in the first round. And this is an average because the closer you go to the bottom, number 30, number 32 now, wow, number 32 in the NHL, the more likelihood you're going to get a bust with zero games or under 50 games. So that's why the game count goes down. So yes, a player can absolutely play a thousand games, be an amazing NHL contributor at a late first round pick, but we can see the bust rate becomes higher because the game count becomes lower. Okay. And you can see here why top five picks are such bulletproof picks. I mean, 900 to 700 games is an awesome NHL career there. So if we're looking at pick 16 to 25, that range they gave you, there's a hundred game difference there. 400 games in the top end, 300 games in the bottom end. So the bust rate for the pick in the teens versus the pick in the twenties isn't too drastic considering compared to the bust rate between, say, a top five pick and a bottom 16 pick. The bust rate significantly increases. So once you go down below a certain threshold, and according to this study, the way I do math, it really is pick 16. They all become pretty similar. Yeah, it gets worse the lower you go down, but it's slower to get worse. The decline gets less likely. So the biggest decline is in the top five. The second biggest decline is in the first 16. There's a moderate decline in pick 16 to 25. It's not too bad. And what you can see is that if you look at average NHL games, they're higher than what Tyler Toffoli has left on his contract. It's not saying Toffoli isn't going to play till he's 35 or 40. He could definitely do that. But what it's saying is that the pick has a likelihood of playing more games than what is left on Tyler Toffoli's current contract, which is a good deal in all for the Montreal Canadiens. And a picture says a thousand words. So let's go ahead and take a look at the 2015, 14 and 13 drafts between pick 15 and 25. So you can see 
what you're really in for with a pick like that, because I think just seeing the names and tying the NHL value to it means a lot. So starting in the 2013 draft, you can see pick 15 down to pick 25 is Pollock all the way down to McCarran. You can see some of the games that were played. That's the higher number here in this column. So Pollock, an elite defenseman, has played 307 games. He's a shutdown guy. He's not a two-way guy. He's not a huge point guy. He's a big shutdown guy along with his buddy, Adam Pellick. Pollock is the more offensive of the, the two, so you could consider him a two-way, but you know that's really top of the mountain in terms of what you're looking at with one of these picks. Nikita Zadorov for Munch, for the Buffalo Sabres, not a bad pick. I think Pollock's the better player. And then you have this dead zone, like Lazar, he's okay. Uh, Reichel, I, I mean, there's, there's just kind of a dead zone here. Even Anthony Mantha was all right. He started off like a house on fire. No, he's not bad. I mean, Gauthier, Freddie Gauthier, no, okay. Poirier, huge bust. Burakovsky, really nice player. Clearly the best one in this group next to Pollock. This is what you're picking with. And if I take a look at this group, Kind of feels 50-50. The 2014 NHL draft, we obviously see the elite superstar Dylan Larkin there. You got Alex Tuck now, the Vegas Golden Knights, Tony D'Angelo, Robbie Fabry, Kasperi Kapanen. I mean, there's a lot of things going on there. Jared McCann, who was a hot topic about that Seattle expansion. But again, you look at this. These are solid NHL contributors. Are they the same as Tyler Toffoli? Some of them are close. One of them is better couple of them are on par and a few of them are below them. So when you take a look again at 2014, you're looking at a better hit rate at this point. But, you know, it's not the greatest one. David Pasternak is there, but he's he's the outlier. I mean, Pasternak is pure elite. It's probably one of the best players to ever be picked at this position. So you got a chance. And I think you're hoping for David Pasternak. And to me, the lottery ticket and the chance to get a guy like Pasta or get a guy like Larkin is just too enticing for the Montreal Canadiens. And just so we can say we did our homework, we'll go ahead and take a look at 2015. This was an excellent draft. Barzell and Connor and Shabbat, elite, elite, elite. <laughs> and Boston boy, did they screw that up? Look at that. Pick 13, 14, and 15. Boston could have had Barzell, Connor, and Shabbat, but wah, wah, wah. Joel Erickson Eck is in there at number 20. Obviously a very good player. Eli Samsonov. Look, Samsonov is a very good player. So is Brock Besser. I mean, there, there's a lot of talent in this range. Jack Rozovic is finally blooming. So this was a loaded draft and probably our best comparison to this current draft. And that's because this current draft is theoretically loaded too. So if it pans out like the 2015 draft, this could be an above average to elite NHL player at this position if we're using the 2015 draft as a guide. If the draft ends up turning out like the 2014, 2013 draft, could be a little bit sketchy, but there's still some talent left in those places. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the players that are in there. You can look at any mock draft you want. You can look at Sportsnest. You can look at Craig Button's list. You can go ahead and look at any list you want. Some are going to be better than others, but at the end of the day, you're looking at a range of players. And by the time you get to pick 15 to 25 in a mock draft, it's already totally blown up anyway, because if you screw up a few picks in the top 10, those errors just compound and then the order of operations gets backwards. So let's take a look at some of the players that are sitting there right now. And what you see here is you see a combination of a lot of wingers, some center and a few D. And there's a reason for that. The centermen usually go higher in the first round because they're the players that are the most coveted in an NHL draft like this. They're a little bit easier to hit than a defenseman. They're a little more difficult than a winger. And if you haven't seen this video before, what I mean is wingers are the easiest to pick. Centers are the second easiest. Defensemen are the hardest to pick out of the player groups. Goalies, absolute crapshoot. There's such a crapshoot that the place people pick goalies is round three through five because it's they have such a high probability to bust. And they take so long to develop that it's almost not worth picking in the first two rounds when you can get another player in it. So wingers low bust rate centers. They don't bust as much, but like it's harder to get them right. It's a very tricky position. Defensemen, extremely tricky position to draft. So we can see here this draft is dominated by a lot of USA players, world players, Finns, Europeans, KHL. They're all over this draft. This isn't a heavy Canadian first round. The last two years were, so don't feel too bad, Canada. Jimmy Snugard, Isaac Howard, Marco Casper. I mean, there are some players in here that are understandably attractive, but because I think they're likely going to pick between 20 and 25, we'll start looking at guys like Ryan Chesley. He's a defenseman here in the United States development program. 
He uses his feet effectively to get back on pucks. He makes a simple play. They're saying this is a meat and potatoes guy. That's what they're saying for you. You come down here to pick 21 to 25. You take a look. You got a couple wingers. Again, the centermen. Like, I can't stress this enough. The centermen that are usually picked in this area are going to convert to wing or they're going to be bottom six centers. That's not what you're looking for to replace Tyler Toffoli. You're looking to find a top six ceiling. So again, the center looks attractive. But I think the most enticing pick here is a player I actually know myself coached against and coached well. That's Denton Matejchuk. Matejchuk, since he was 13 years old and working within the hockey Manitoba system, he has been a very steady player. So this write-up that they talk about, a steady Eddie who defends well, mixes it up with point production. That means he's a two-way guy. He plays defense as well as he plays offense. And 39 points in 42 games in the WHL for an 18 or 19-year-old defenseman is massive. That is a huge offensive contribution. He'll always have a place in the lineup because he moves pucks efficiently and effectively. What they're saying about this player is he has a very good chance of being a top six NHL defenseman. Worst case, he's going to be pairing five or six. Best case, he's going to be pairing three or four. Yes, the ceiling could be one or two, but if you get a three or four guy as a defensive pairing, because defense are so hard to find late in the first round, that's money. That's what I would be looking at in this pick if I was Montreal. I'd be hunting defensemen because defensemen are so volatile. The defensemen that are picked in the top 10 and yeah, they're very good defensemen, but they do have a more than higher bust rate than the wingers or the centermen. So it's a good decision to start looking at defensemen later in the first round because elite defensemen are known to fall. It happens all the time. So I would start looking at a guy like Matej Chuck with that pick and go, OK, I'm likely going to get a top five pick because, well, I'm not very good this year and hopefully it's Shane Wright. So if I'm the Canadians, hopefully we fill that spot there. And then at the back end, maybe I can get a solid contributor on defense who may not play next year, but he'll hopefully play by the time he's 22. So three years between junior and the AHL move into a five, six pairing. And hopefully by the time he's 26, 27 years old, he's going to be a top four player in the Montreal Canadiens. And I know Habs fans are going, ah, 10 years, it could take 10 10 years for this pick to develop? Yes. Welcome to the NHL in the world of rebuilds. You want them to be able to develop in two to three years, but defensemen, a lot of them, it takes until their 26th or 27th birthday before they really become comfortable in the NHL game. There is a ton of defensemen that are good between the ages of 20 and 25. Of course, we all want Kale McCars and Adam Foxes, but it doesn't happen that often. There's a lot of great defensemen that just take time to develop. And that could happen. So 26, 27 is your worst case scenario um, in terms of hitting your maximum potential as defenseman. But it's possible. That's why when you're in a rebuild, they're not usually the fastest things in the world. And teams who are very twitchy or they can't stand rebuilds like the Boston Bruins, Pittsburgh Penguins, they trade their picks for established players all the time because they just don't have time to wait for them to develop. That's why they do it. Montreal is signaling they're going to build for the draft. So Hughes, Gorton, they're going to do well at building. Go ahead, take a look at the links below. Below, take a look at some of the articles about draft picks. Go ahead, read up about some of the best players. And Montreal fans, stay here, subscribe, be with us because I'm going to cover the NHL draft and Shane Wright and who you're going to be taking because that's just what I do. That was my job before I dropped in on YouTube as a high performance coach here. While you're at it, take a look at a couple of these Habs videos or trade videos that we've loaded up for you. We'll catch you in the next one.